Hello, everyone. Hope you had a good short break. I'm going to take a moment to introduce uh, the panel uh, facilitator for the panel that's coming up right now. And um, just so you know that the panel here that we're going to focus on on this, um, this Zoom channel, hi, Amber and Shamira, <laughs> to see you both. Um, this is uh, this panel is Black Fiber Systems. And simultaneous to this panel, we have a panel on pathways of water and soil. Both are recorded. So if you stay on this track and there was information in the other panel that you also wanted to glean, no worries, it's recorded and it'll all end up on the website in a few days. So um, with no further ado, I, I'm really excited to introduce um, an incredibly, um, <laughs> an incredibly important colleague um, and partner in, in this work, um, Teju Adisa Farrar. She is a Jamaican American writer and geographer. Her work centers on climate and environmental justice, adaptive responses, ecological resilience, and cultural equity. To date, Teju has done projects in Israel, Palestine, Denmark, Panama, the USA, Botswana, and several more on myriad issues spanning from urban exclusion to regenerative economies to black geographies. Her approach encourages us to connect the dots between space, place, and identity. Teju supports artists, activists, initiatives, collectives, and organizations who are mapping and making alternative futures. It's my great pleasure to introduce Teju and the women who are accompanying her on this panel, Amber Tam, Shamira Covington. So for those of you who are staying um, within this space, you're gonna have a great time. And for those of you who would like to um, go to the Pathways of Water and Soil panel, I will be moderating that panel and I will meet you over there. Um, and so the link should be in the chat. Um, and I see, Gavin, that it's link in, is it's there. It's in the chat now, yep. All right, so everybody who, and so Teju, you might wanna give people just a minute or two to make that link adjustment. Have a beautiful time. I can't wait to hear this panel in the recording. I gotta go over there though for the moment. <laughs> Rebecca, your, uh, your, uh, your link to the other places should be in the chat for you. Wonderful. Your All panelist right. link. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Hi, everyone. To those of you who are staying, as Rebecca said, my name is Teju, and I'm here with Shamir and Amber. We have about an hour and a half together, a little bit less than that, and I'm sure the time will fly by. Um, so I'm going to begin by sharing my screen so we can get into it and start this conversation. So as um, Rebecca said, today we'll be talking about black fiber systems, um, how they show up in pre-colonial histories as well as in modern practices. And Shamira and Amber will be joining me to ground this conversation. And I wanna start by giving a quick overview. Um, it's not gonna be comprehensive, but I wanna just create some context and connect the dots to some of the ways that black communities have had relationships to fiber over time. So textile patterns and dyeing as early as the 11th century indicate a long history of fiber cultivation and manufacture as part of tropical West African communities. So as early as 900 AD, there was language for fibers in over a hundred um, West African languages. There was some word for cotton, mostly derived from the Arabic word katen. Additionally, there was a sort of regional fiber processing system in place. Archaeological evidence found fake ceramic spindle whorls for spinning fibers and spinning cotton, particularly along with cotton seeds and pollen. So there was also this cultivation from seed to fiber. Um, it's also clear that cotton was a culture. It was grown perennially in many small communities, as well as manufactured for trade across the continent. 
What archaeologists realize is that it's actually a textile culture. It's not only a cotton culture. There was use of other raw materials to make bark cloth, raffi, and bast, for example. So all throughout Western Africa as early as 900 AD, they're starting to see this development of cultivating fiber from seed all the way to textiles. And so bast fiber is one of the fibers that was used in pre-colonial Africa. It was usually woven along with cotton for ritual use and burial cloth. Um, spun for weaving and tied with lengths of raffia leaf and skeins about 20 inches long. This has been happening as early as 1000 AD and still continues on in some cultures, particularly in Nigeria. Raffia was another type of cloth that was created from the raffia palm tree. It made these traditional costumes that European explorers described as grass-like, but actually they came from the raffia palm tree. And this particular cloth was popular from the Congo Basin all the way to Madagascar. So it had quite a far reach and there was all these traditional ways of weaving it and braiding it to make different types of clothes. But really, West Africa was one of the world centers of cotton cultivation. Um, not only was there spinning and weaving, but there was intense cotton textile design. So weft, for example, which is adding patterns to a ground weave, was a popular form of textile design in tropical West Africa and regions that are now Sierra Leone, Liberia, Mali, Nigeria, Ghana, and many others um, on the coast of West Africa and even in Central Tropical Africa as well. And so for nearly five centuries, fiber cultivation and textile design was incorporated into traditional rituals and daily life in African communities. The power of this traditional textile design was that it was decentralized and based on what was specifically available in the bioregion. So they used what was available in the soil, what grew there naturally as a way to develop these natural fibers and create this textile culture. Colonial powers tried to subvert local cultivation of cotton and other natural fibers, which through the years of colonization, followed by neo-colonial trade agreements has been done. And though colonial powers centralized textile manufacturing, which decreased, but didn't eradicate traditional textile design and craftsmanship. So although the centralization of te textile manufacturing because of British and French colonization happened, it didn't eradicate these traditional um, seed to fiber cultivation and craftsmanship practices that were happening. European colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade shifted West Africa's relationship to fiber cultivation and textile culture. New world cotton seeds, meaning cotton seeds that were endemic to uh, North America and the Americas were introduced to West African agricultural cycles during the transatlantic slave trade. Sometimes these seeds were voluntarily adopted and other times forced on farmers under colonial rule. So this set into motion the erosion of endemic cotton seeds, the erosion of this regional textile trade and culture that had existed for five centuries and the erosion of this small scale fiber production. However, these fiber and textile knowledges were brought to the new world. They migrated with the Africans and became lineages in the Americas. One of the ways these indigenous agricultural practices were carried over was by African women braiding seeds into their hair before crossing the Atlantic. So archaeologists found in places like South Carolina and North Carolina that the rice seeds that were being cultivated for a couple hundred years in America were brought over by African women who had braided these seeds and a variety of other seeds into their hair. So some of the foods that we have here like okra and yams, which are endemic and, and native to West African were brought over here by women transporting this knowledge physically in their hair. Additionally, um, before the creation of the cotton gin, uh, Africans used a comb-like tool to separate cotton fibers from their seed. This tool was developed in West Africa and brought over, and it was a tool that enslaved Africans used to separate the cotton fibers from their seed until the development of the cotton gin. 
and finally, the Gullah Geechee people on the Sea Islands, which is off the coast of the southern eastern United States, are direct descendants of enslaved Africans, and they continue these African agricultural practices, like planting seeds with one's heel to disturb the soil less. So you make an indentation in the soil with your heel, you drop the seed in, and cover it over with your foot. That allows the soil to regenerate without disturbing it. So some of these practices and knowledges were brought over through the transatlantic slave trade by these Africans who were then enslaved in the Americas. So there's these relationships to agriculture also include relationships to sea and natural waterways. As a result of the slave trade in the Americas, many Black communities developed along the coastlines during the 18th and 19th centuries because that's where slave ships docked. There is a link between sort of blackness, the development of a black identity and closeness to water. There's a spiritual relationship to water that was integrated into this black diasporan culture. So in the Afro-Brazilian Orisha religion, Yemaya is the water goddess. She's the water spirit. She is the patron saint of the oceans and the rivers. Orisha religious practice evolved from pre-colonial Yoruba religion. So again, we see these spiritual relationships to the earth and particularly to water being brought over and evolved as black communities developed in the Americas. Maroons, who were enslaved Black Africans who escaped from plantations, built their own self-sustaining communities throughout the Americas and the Caribbean. These villages were usually in the mountains or the thick of the forest, in the case of Jamaica, or in the case of the Brazilian Amazon above waterfalls. Sometimes these fugitive slave communities were created along with the indigenous people of the Americas. The Maroons used water and waterways as foundational to their sustainability of their villages, as well as for a way of life. For them, uh, knowing how to navigate rivers was vital to continued freedom and subsistence. In Mexico's Costa Chica region, Cimarrones, which is a Spanish word for maroons, relied on lagoons to deal with the difficult landscape for life and sustenance. So water and soil and agriculture was connected to this way of life for people who were enslaved, as well as for the Black Africans who escaped slavery and started their own agricultural communities in the thick of nature. Meanwhile, in North America, we see plantation slavery and the cultivation of cotton happening in a very different way, in a very exploitative way. So the European settlers in the Americas um, aim to centralize power, monopolize space, and exploit land for profit through instituting plantation slavery. This was uh, done by mass cultivating cotton, and the mass cultivation of cotton in U.S. Uh, slavery required clearing the land, which caused excessive deforestation. European settlers needed tree wood to build plantation houses and fences. This deforestation meant there was less natural cover to protect against natural disasters and uh, to create climate stabilizations. Monoculture, meaning cultivating one crop primarily, meant eliminating insects and animals that want your crop because of habitat displacement due to deforestation. So that meant that European settlers had to get rid of biodiversity, which includes plants that sequester carbon. Additionally, excessive tillage and soil turnover resulted in widespread soil erosion in the south of the United States. There was not enough time between harvests for the soil aggregates to regenerate because they were trying to produce as much cotton for profit as possible. So throughout the south, there was lots and lots of soil erosion, which still affects the earth and the loam today. And finally, bringing white cotton to allow for mass production and consistency of products. Um, cotton comes in many different shades from brown to white, but by mass producing it uh, for profit, it requires uniformity. So trying to create the most uniform seed possible. For example, by the time Haiti won independence from France in 1804, most of their land was no longer arable due to the monocultural practices of cultivating cotton, sugarcane, and coffee under French colonization and enslavement. So just, a, just an example of the impact that plantation slavery had on the soil and the arable land in North America, as well as throughout the Caribbean. 
And one of the primary reasons why Black Africans were forced into slavery was because of their agricultural knowledges and their ability to work variegated lands, their adeptness at cotton cultivation. Tropical Africans' extensive history of cotton cultivation and production was without doubt valuable to the plantation economy growing across the Americas. But enslaved Africans were not only picking cotton and separating it from the seed, they were also spinning it into fibers. I want to talk about um, Sojourner Truth. This is a quote from a blog called Crafting Freedom by Romilly Gil Imhotep. It says, one notable formerly enslaved proto-Black feminist abolitionist who worked fibers and cloth is Sojourner Truth. Born around 1790 in Ulster County of New York State, known for its wool production, Truth is said to have been forcefully employed to spin wool at the age of 13 after being purchased by John J. Dumont of New Platts. Dumont promised Truth her freedom in accordance with the New York State legislation that sought to abolish slavery in the state on July 4th of 1827, but ultimately reneged on his promise. In response to this betrayal, the record shows that Truth committed to work for Dumont through the summer of 1826 while plotting her own self manumission. She made up her mind to fulfill her duties by spinning about 100 pounds of wool into homespun yarn. Historian Nell Painter speculates this would have likely taken her around six months to accomplish. And in most of the iconography and imagery of Sojourner Truth, she's holding um, needles and knit knitting needles and yarn. After buying her own freedom, Sojourner Truth was part of the Northampton Association of Education and Industry. This was an evangelical abolitionist collective in Massachusetts. The NIEI um, bought farmland and a silk mill called Nantucket Silk Company. They hired fugitive, fugitive slaves, escaped slaves, to work alongside them in this mill and live in this community. So throughout the enslavement and into Reconstruction, Black people were working with fiber and developing their relationship to fiber and textiles. Black crafting traditions were developed during the period of enslavement and emancipation. They commonly used textiles and fabrics, most notably in the form of quilting. These crafting traditions continued on in the form of textile arts, seams for sing, et cetera. So Black people have had rich relationships to soil, water, and fibers for centuries. We have embodied our physical environment wherever we are as a part of our culture. This embodiment is being re-articulated in current conversations about sustainability, but Black communities are largely left out. And so I'm going to pass it over to Shamira to talk about these intersections between sustainability, racism, and Black communities. Uh, Shamira, take it away. Let me know when you want me to change slides. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to discuss um, the intersections of systemic racism and sustainability within what I call the fashion industrial complex. And so we'll be specifically delving into the erasure of racialized histories and spaces in sustainable fashion conversations. And I really want to harp on that embodiment is in relationship with space. And so historically black communities have lived sustainably despite the white majority now being the gatekeepers of sustainable trends. So we'll go um, a little bit into the social and political history of race and what's considered the fashion industry and then talk through how that manifests in the contemporary sustainability market. Um, and you can change the slide. A little bit of background. Um, I enter this space as a black studies and a fashion scholar. So my lens of the fashion industry, including sustainability, includes the collaboration of the fashion industry and the social and political systems of society. Obviously for every industry in a capitalist society like we live in, there is um, an element of, of profit generation. And so I refer to all these aspects of an industrial complex. So um, some of us might be familiar with the prison industrial complex and I liken the fashion industry to that same concept because it pursues its own financial interests regardless of and often at the expense of society, the environment, individuals. Um, and so there's also this component of labor exploitation um, in regards to the fashion industry that we'll also discuss. Um, it's also important to note that the general development of commerce, industry, and issues of sustainability in the US, I focus largely on the US, is closely intertwined with the history of the slave trade and slavery as Teju was um, speaking on. You can change the slide, please. 
the U.S. fiber textile and fashion industries development, um, and I'm talking about the period between 1790 and 1860, it was strongly connected through various routes to the slave trade and the slave-based um, Atlantic economic system. So from the 17th to the 19th century, there was general dependence on African slave labor in the Atlantic economic system, and there was a significant and direct involvement of New England's New England's merchants to the slave trade. So I want to be specific that slavery, the slave trade, and this exploitation of labor was not isolated to the US South. It was the whole country um, interacting in this. New England's maritime um, trade and shipping heavily depended on slave-based economies of the Atlantic Ocean. And those early industries were like shipbuilding, rum manufacturing, and textiles. And slave-grown Southern cotton stimulated a regional specialization, which created a large domestic market for New England's cotton industry. So where the um, fashion and textile industry burgeoned. All of this demonstrates that slave labor played a key role in the industrialization of the US and the development of fiber, textile, and fashion industries, and thus capitalism as a whole in the US. And it also illustrates that black bodies and labor were important commodities of the institution of slavery and for the development of what we consider the textile industries. Next slide, please. And these are just some historical connections and examples in visual form. So uh, the image on the left is from 1895 in Georgia, where I live. It serves to illustrate um, the labor at all levels of cotton tending. Um, as you can see, there are both men and women. There are children and adults working in this cotton plantation. And if you look in the back, you can see an overseer or a slave master on a horse watching the slaves. And so black labor in the land is an embodied experience, right? In literally working the land, black bodies symbolically and physically are connected to that land and more intimately to the crops that they tended. Um, in this case, we're talking about cotton. And then we can discuss later in our panel, perhaps issues of displacement uh, dispossession and belonging as it relates to land embodiment and sustainability. The middle image um, serves more to show one of uh, the historical relationships of slaves and textiles or clothing. This photo is from uh, 1863 and the caption on this photo, photo read, young, slaves during, young slave during the Civil War reduced to show was, I'm sorry, young slave during the Civil War reduced to such poverty he is wearing only rags which is fine, but slaves were only giving rags to wear anyway. And so slave owners gave their slaves clothing allotments once or twice a year, despite the slaves often making the clothes on the plantation for both slaves um, on that plantation and the slave owner's family. And clothing was also used as a form of punishment with slaves being forced to work naked, um, men and women having to wear the opposite gender clothing, so this example just shows another embodied element of black people in textiles um, and how they were intimately connected. And there were inevitab inevitably times where slaves were wearing the fibers, the actual fibers that they, that they helped um, to create. In this last image here, um, it became popular in 2016, but I've noticed that it's making its rounds on social media again. And it's from a furniture restorer um, who had acquired a 200 year old chair and found it stuffed with cotton and slave hair. The chair came from somewhere in North Georgia and it serves as, serves as a pretty obvious example of the embodied relationship between black people, labor and fibers. It's literally showing us that a part of black bodies hair was combined with textiles to serve a slave owning home or family. And the furniture restorer who you can find on YouTube working on um, this chair said, imagine how many humans, humans it took to create this chair. So what does all of this have to do with sustainability, right? You can change the slide. Slaves provided the main agricultural workforce and their knowledge and expertise, as Teju said, required crop cultivation on plantations, namely cotton, rice and cotton, that did not exist among slave owners who transferred a slave-based economy to the US. The techniques of crop production were vested in knowledge carried by many stolen Africans and then passed on from generation to generation. And there's a lot of archival research 
to indicate that agrarian ethics, which includes sustainability and environmental ethics, emerged from slavery. Black people have always had the knowledge of the land in which they labored, and there was it was intimate and precise, and it had material, social, and political usefulness. The same slaves and their descendants after emancipation were then exploited as sharecroppers in the US, which speaks to the, use, the usefulness of their knowledge, right? Through a history of slavery and institutional racism um, and Black people's attempts to build an abiding connection to the land, there's a complicated and difficult legacy um, that is not known, right? We don't know it because of systemic racism. And there's also this spiritual component, as Teju talked about, and that spiritual aspect comes from African traditional religions in which everything has a spiritual importance, including the land, including the way we labor in the land. And a lot of this is not common knowledge, again, because of systemic racism, um, but there's evidence that lots of coveted Black ancestors were sustainability champions. Next slide, please. For example, George Washington Carver, who we know as the peanut guy, um, he also developed products from renewable raw materials and his attitude toward waste and his advocacy of natural farming methods pre-aged all of the current efforts that we see now to build an ecologically sound future. Next slide. Also Harriet Tubman, she used her ecological expertise to lead slaves to freedom and runaway slaves have written in their slave narratives about um, Harriet Tubman that they also um, would come into contact with Native American communities on their journeys and that they were sharing knowledge. So there, this indicates that there's a symbiotic exchange between Native and Black worldviews, particularly as it relates to environmental thinking. Um, and so we see this interface between justice, sustainability, and the land. And it's not hard to make these connections between the land, the environment, the body, the Black experience, sustainability, all of these are intertwined when we start thinking about them. Next slide. And so race is an important concern for sustainability. So for contemporary fiber, textile, and fashion markets, we have this erasure of the racialized histories of both fashion and sustainability. The mainstream sustainability market as we know it is the domain of middle and upper class white folks, right? and it's not accessible to everyone. And because we live in a capitalistic white dominated society, um, even sustainability, sustainability has been commodified, which makes absolutely no sense. We know that sustainable fashion, eco-friendly merchandise is reserved for people of the higher echelons of life. And we see that in marketing materials. Things, even things like composting in your backyard, um, is assuming that people have access to a backyard and that can be something exclusive. And when you phrase it in that way, people that don't have that access may not think that it is something that they can do. Next slide. Even looking at merchandising and marketing efforts of sustainable merchandise, it's first of all overpriced and it perpetuates a certain type of person can wear it. Um, there are these prices are often out of range for what we consider the average consumer and certainly the average like low income black or brown consumer, right? Next slide. And we see sustainability efforts being perpetuated by this white dominated society, which leaves the environmental justice component for the black and brown and poor folks. And what we have to take into, into account when talking about sustainability is the racialized context. The, envir the environmental justice movement, um, which is characterized by concerns over the unequal distribution of environmental burdens on black and brown folks is, is a, a sector that is reserved for people that live in urban areas, right? You can see on this bottom image here, these are smoke billows from one of the many chemical plants in Mississippi that they call the Cancer Alley. This photo was taken in 2013. And it is of course um, populated by predominantly communities of color. We are all pretty familiar with Flint, Michigan and the water there being contaminated with lead. And then the photo on the right of the screen is from last year of um, a girl named Kanaya Patterson. She's standing in front of a sugarcane field 
um, in Florida and the smoke from that sugar cane field burns into her yard and triggers her asthma and other people's, um, it impedes other people's breathing in the community. And all of this assumes that black, brown, poor folks are fighting against oppressive powers that are trying to squelch their economic freedoms. And that while they're doing that fighting, they're not involved in sustainable practices, which is not true. They are involved in sustainable practices. Next slide. And that's because they've had to be sustainable out of necessity. Um, I wanna bring together that for black and brown folks, sustainability is not new. Um, the way in which it has been repackaged by the white mainstream is new, but sustainable ways of living have been passed down through generations and generations um, in black and other low income communities long before the sustainable fashion movement gained any traction, even though we're widely underrepresented in the industry. So individual family practice like saving and reusing plastic bags, acquiring hand-me-downs, riding a bike because you can't afford a car, are all sustainable practices that have been happening. And there are also widespread practices like community gardens, um, your people going out and affecting policy change, and they've all been happening forever. Next slide. On a wider scale, Black activists have been championing environmental and sustainability efforts as it relates to environmental justice. Um, Patrice Colliers, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, has said that Racism is endemic to global inequality. This means that those most affected and killed by, by climate change are black and poor people. There's longstanding racist policies and practices such as uh, residential segregation, unequal education opportunities and limited prospects for economic advantage, which have led to increased vulnerability of black people to climate change, which impacts and by extension other global crises that emerge. So just as we see there's a relationship between black history and sustainability, there's also a relationship between racial justice and climate change. And that relationship is burgeoning in um, other areas such as black specific spaces. Next slide, please. Some of those spaces um, that have become popular, for example, Dominique Drakeford's um, work, who's amazing, created Melanin Ass, which is a create, which is a platform that discusses the issues and celebrates the success of communities of color in sustainable fashion and beauty spaces. The space gives the ethical industry an authentic and culturally relevant voice. There's also the Black Sustainability Summit, which is an annual gathering hosted by Sustainable Community Solutions Network. And they are committed to sustainable development and providing interdisciplinary edu educational resources to people of African descent. And then of course, we have social media influencers, um, black influencers who are working to illuminate social justice and environmentalism like Green Girl Leah. Next slide. And so what, what are the implications of this knowledge? Why do we need it? Well, for black folks and allies, the legacy of slavery and the connection to land and sustainability can serve as a space for empowerment to uplift the history, stories and activism of black people in sustainability spaces. Additionally, there are a few places where this work can be done, such as the land, um, urban communities and on various media outlets such as social media, um, which I've been very grateful for the burgeoning of, um, of Black people in sustainability spaces. And then encounter spaces, spaces that I uh, mentioned before and even spaces like this panel are amazing examples of how erase represent representation can be reified in white dominated uh, mainstream spaces. And hopefully in our panel discussion, we'll come up with some more. Thank you. Thank you, Shamira. <clears throat> so as Shamira has illuminated, Black people today engage with our natural environment, the daily necessity of fiber, and preserving all life with the fourths of these legacies on our shoulders. And as Shamira began to talk about some of the current sustainability practices, I want to talk a little bit more about the ways that Black people are continuing to engage with soil, water, and the land with current initiatives. And I wanna mention one called Acres of Ancestry. This is from their website. The Acres of Ancestry Initiative Black Agrarian Fund is a self-sustaining collaboration to preserve our ancestors value paradigm anchored in collective land tenure, spirit culture reclamation and ecological harmony. 
channeling, <clears throat> excuse me, channeling the collective spirit of the Freedom Quilting Bee, a textile craft cooperative founded by Black women agrarian artisans in Alberta, Alabama in 1966. The Acres of Ancestry Initiative recenters eco-cultural traditions in collaboration with rural communities throughout the Black Belt region through storytelling, communal e-commerce, eco-cultural heritage, and textile arts production, and traditional knowledge retention programs to support cultural regeneration and establish a sustainable funding stream to seed the Black Agrarian Fund. So again, it's about returning Black people to the land, having ecological sustainability, as well as healthy, positive relationships to agriculture and the land. So as we think about modern practices of Black agricultural relationships, we have to acknowledge the history as Shamir and I did while looking forward to the future of Black farmers. And with that, I wanna introduce Amber Tam, who's gonna talk about her experience as being a Black farmer and horticulturalist. Amber, over to you. Hello, beautiful people. I first want to honor these two wonderful sisters. Just to speak after y'all, I truly feel like I don't have to say anything, which is a gift as a farmer to, to just enter spaces where the historical components are already told so that we can get to the agricultural components and not have to explore Black farmer history. So thank y'all. Um, I'm here as a storyteller mainly. I think what I offer to agriculture is very much so that. As you can see, men the two women mentioned Harriet Tubman, who I'm looking at on my wall, and Sojourner Truth. Um, what I found about those two powerful Black women and Black women all throughout agricultural history is our stories are never told and they're deeply uh, buried in the ground. And there are things that I think that we should know from Black women who have worked the land with our Black brothers in the past, but also moving forward into a realm where women are coming into more positions of leadership, especially pertaining to agriculture, we are to tell our stories now. Um, I'll start by saying I am 25 years old and I'm from New York City, very close to the freedom grounds of Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. Harriet Tubman's house is in Aubrey, New York. So Joyner Truth is in New Paltz, which are both minimum five hours away. So I feel blessed to walk on these grounds, which are also <sighs> the indigenous grounds of the Deer, Iroquois, and Lenape people. So I also just want to hail them up to you. So I walked into agriculture through very fierce intersections. Um, I'm just going to get straight to it and real raw. And I, I apologize if I trigger anyone, but this story is a form of healing. Um, my father murdered my mom seven years ago. April will make seven years ago. And that's a very strong social justice component because my father was an NYPD transit police officer undercover for 20 years. Therefore, a black man arresting his own people to feed his own people, with, which eventually caused corruption. So what I saw as a young child is what it looks like for America to corrupt one black man before my eyes and take it out on the wrong people, which is a very much so a slave narrative. And you can hear those narratives throughout slave, slave autobiographies. Um, and that left me in a space of needing housing, needing income and needing food. And those are things that I am not fortunate enough to be from a family that comes from the South to have land that we can go back to. I'm also not of Caribbean descent. So I do also don't have any links to any family homes in the Caribbean. So I was legitimately homeless at the age of 18. And so what was offered was you could either become a farmer or you could either work on a ship, right? And that brings back that narrative of the connection to land, the connection of water. And I found that very interesting at the time to see that there was no connection to working in an office because an office can supply me with those things. But to work on the grounds of water or land could provide me with the things that I need for my liberty itself. And so I chose specifically farming because that was a narrative as a child that I wanted to do. I, when I was in third grade, I had a very clear vision of wanting to farm and not understanding any of it, but didn't tell anyone and didn't inquire because within Black families, being a farmer was not something welcomed. And I'm sure other brown people can understand this narrative as it was something that was done to oppress and enslave. So why would we return to that? 
So I held that vision to myself for many years until I was in a position to have autonomy to decide what I'm gonna do. And so I chose farming for that reason, but also I, I refused to be exploited on water. So I knew exploitation was gonna be very loud. And I was like, I would rather be exploited on the middle of nowhere in land than rather in the middle of the ocean. Um, and so that led me to my first farm, which was in upstate New York. And from there, I ended up farming, I ended up migrant farming across the US. So I was an American woman, American black woman at the age of 18 on the migrant farm trail with Mex a large amount of Mexican population and a large amount of Caribbean population. And I'm super grateful because in the in the spectrum of black farmers, I have yet to meet other black farmers that have experienced this, but I'm here to verify that whatever migrant farmers are telling you about their experiences, they are for sure real. And from my experiences of showing up on big conventional farms and calling out landowners, specifically white landowners for the ways in which they are culturally oppressing people and then financially oppressing people has been a big part of my journey. But I also feel the narrative of Black people doing that is very unheard of. So I was able to share with Black community digitally all the different landscapes that I was encountering. So as a true Brooklynite and native New Yorker, my family has been in Brooklyn for four generations now. This was very groundbreaking for people to see. So that's how I got to this apex of getting to this position of being able to help people integrate more earth into their life. So that's more of the logistical side. But on the spiritual side, once I lowered my mom's body into the ground, I at the time when I saw that happening, I didn't know I would be working with earth. But when I think now, it absolutely 1000% makes sense that I work with the earth. Because if we are to believe that trees communicate with each other through their roots, then we are to believe that our fingers are the equivalent of roots. And so when we touch ground, when we touch ground, we are communicating with our ancestors. And so for me, if you're asking like seven years ago, you lost your parents in two very different ways. How are you the same? It is solely, solely only on the premise of me working with Mama Earth and receiving that deep healing and being able to communicate with my mothers of my lineage that go on forever and are buried in different parts of the ground to get those prayers out and receive the nourishment back. So I'm just gonna end there because I'm sure there's gonna be a bunch of questions and I would rather converse with my sisters and hear what y'all wanna ask. But I am a complete open book. So when it comes to my personal narrative, I'm open to any questions about that. Thank you so much, Amber. So as we can see, the relationships to soil and land and water for Black geographies is violent, but also healing and sacred. It is deeply rooted in Black diaspora cultural life. It is a sort of culture of nature. And so I hope throughout this session you have learned some of the ways that black communities have relationship to the land have relationship to soil and water and i want to use the rest of the time to sort of develop a conversation with shamara and amber as well as answer the many many questions that i know are coming in um, so before i start opening it up to questions I personally have some questions that I would like to ask both of you. I want to start with you, Amber, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your experience with being a farmer and trying to access land, as well as how um, your relationship to the earth has continued to help you heal as you continue this journey and trying to get land as a farmer. Absolutely, and this is so relevant to my life right now in terms of where the future of farming is going, where younger farmers are wanting to secure land at an earlier age than traditional agriculture has expressed and shown us. But also this morning I was watching a Growing Cultures um, Hunger for Justice series, which was with the provost family, who was one of the families in the South right now fighting very, very hard for their land. And they're from a generation of black farmers who have been fighting very hard for their land. My personal journey has been one of confusion. I entered farming 
knowing that this is the work that I want to do, but not seeing any models to help me expedite getting to a place where I'm paid, where I'm healthy, where I can extend things to my family and extend positions to friends and family that want to learn how to farm. Um, and so what I'll say is for those who don't know what agriculture has looked like is there has been land passed down from family member to family member, and then the whole families themselves are working the land, and that's been the trajectory. If that is not the trajectory, it has looked like a person working in an industry that has nothing to do with agriculture and everything to do with a paycheck, them saving for maybe 20, 30 years, and then transitioning into agriculture with a savings account. So for me, my juxtaposition was okay, I'm pretty much outcasted from society, which is how I ended up on the migrant farm trail with immigrants when I'm not an immigrant because my life is looking very different than everybody else in my peer group where I don't have a, a grandpa or a grandma or a mom or a dad or an auntie or an uncle to help me figure out anything. So now I have to make mistakes to figure it out. But aside from that, the reality is I entered farming, I recognized that the federal agricultural rate till this day is 725, which means it is absolutely legal for any farmer to pay their employees $7.25, which is by far so under what the national minimum wage is. So if that's legal, how is one supposed to say, I want to sequester carbon to stop climate change, but I'm getting paid for sure less than $13 an hour. And it's possible that if a farmer really can't pay me, they can pay me $7 an hour. So how am I supposed to take care of myself, take care of my family, but also save money for land ownership by farming? But also why would I then go into maybe a tech position, which is gonna pay me more and I get health insurance, but then I'm not inquiring the skill to be a skillful farmer. So that was like my five years of farming is like, how am I supposed to become a good farmer, but also how am I going to get land quick? Because if we're going to right now in New York City, there is a clock at Union Square, which is a countdown to the end of the world. Literally, it is a doomsday clock that says we have seven years and it's counting down every minute. So if we're going to uplift things like that and we want to have a narrative of climate change, then like land access needs to be at the forefront, because when it comes to buying land to sequester carbon, that's what we need to be talking about. I do not feel very good about people educating others about farming practices, about soil education or soil health or any of that, when these people will be equipped and ready to go, but with no land to activate on. And so that, what I see is the realm in which most black and brown city folks are stuck in, which is there's all of these urban farm nonprofits popping up that wanna help black and brown communities connect to the earth. And then we get connected, we loved it because it's within our ancestral selves to love that work and to also undo that trauma. But then we're stuck like, well, this is what I wanna do, but how do I do it? So my, my recent steps have been I launched a GoFundMe this year, this summer, and I was able to secure 100K in six days to at least put a down payment on a piece of land. But what I extended to community that were con contributing was, this is not my land. It will never be my land for as long as we are all contributing. But the beauty of that was once I launched that GoFundMe, other Black farmers launched GoFundMe because they saw it worked. But because I had, a large amount of money already handed to me, I was able to take a thousand from that GoFundMe and then spread it to other Black farmers. So between Black farmers on the internet, we have our own mutual aid network to support each other. And I think that can be a foundational model so that we can move from the realm of, let me put in work into an industry I don't wanna be in for 30 years just to save up money to do what I actually wanna do. And that's why we have a very small aging rate of farmers. It's like once they leave that career path, they're probably 40. That means that they have a solid another 40 years to be able to teach us what to do, to teach us how to work land, to become really great farmers, which is not a long time. But if we think about 
we know that there's young farmers that are 25 and younger that want to dedicate themselves to this. Where is the land? We would have a rampant amount of food. On top of, we can replicate models like Soul Fire Farm has, which is solidarity shares. And we can share amongst each other as farmers. So that's been my like really tricky pathway. And the last thing I want to bring up is there is a lot of conversation between Black farmers about collaboration and collective land ownership um, and what that looks like. And those are some of the conversations I'll be in entering and sharing on my social media platform within the next coming year. Thanks for sharing that, Amber. We know land access is really key. And also I think it is this conversation around how do you think about buying and selling land on stolen land? And so we know that this is indigenous land that black people have been interlinked with through slavery, but also this is not our land. It's not the land of white European settlers, but because of settler displacement, now all of most of the land is owned by mainly white families and transferred through that lineage without acknowledging indigenous sovereignty. So I think part of the conversation about land access also has to be about indigenous people getting their land back and teaching us and remembering, because some of it has been taken away from them, remembering the ways that they stewarded land for centuries before settlers came. So I think it's really important what you're doing, what you're saying. Um, and I hope that as you continue this journey, you guys can continue to connect and create this network. And so um, again, before I open up the questions fully, I just want Shamira, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your work around how decolonization is central to the fiber and fashion industry, particularly as it pertains to Black people gaining access to that industry. Yeah, so um, my work really centers around um, putting a spotlight on Black contributions to the U.S. fashion industry. And so my, my main work goes into how, how capitalism was, was formed and how it's perpetuated now into the fashion industry and especially the sustainability industry. And for me, um, my thought about how the sustainability industry operates um, within fashion is that it's still capitalist. And so it's inadvertently unsustainable for it to to work in the fashion industry um, specifically we we market and advertise for people to buy more of things that's that's the commerce exchange of the fashion industry we want you to buy more and so when we're talking about the sustainability portion of that we don't want you to buy more we want you to stop buying more don't buy more even if it's sustainable fashion which is amazing and it 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 lasts longer, it's gonna be a higher quality, all of that, yes, but the way, the way in which we're communicating how sustainable fashion works, how the history behind it, again, um, is just very problematic for me. So my research is uncovering those, those problematics and, and trying to get people to think more critically about, about sustainability in general. Thank you, Shamira. And I think I, I'm gonna open it up to questions. I think this is maybe a question that you could answer. Um, Phoebe asks, how to resolve this issue between the ideas of the real cost of things, paying for each stage fairly, and the cost being outside of the realm of possibility for Black people? Yeah, so my, again, my issue is the, the capitalist portion of it. So, so how the fashion industry works is that prices are, are driven down based on um, low wages, right? So we outsource most of how, most of our fashion is outsourced to countries where um, we can pay lower wages for the labor. And so my thoughts about how we offset that is to hire and um, hire locally in the US. So US um, created clothing and to 
to work with um, black and brown farmers, black and brown um, seamstresses, black and brown designers, so that some of those funds get redistributed to people who have been underrepresented in the industry and um, people who have the expertise um, here in the US and, and can, can help drive the cost lower. Thanks, Shamira. And hopefully there's a lot of questions about cost and fairness. So hopefully that answers some of those questions. I also want to put out a question to either of you uh, from DMC Connell. What are your thoughts on how white and non-Black people can work to increase the accessibility of sustainable products and practices, as well as lift up environmental justice issues in communities like Flint without co-opting the space that should be held for Black voices and Black efforts. I would say a lot of my conversations to specifically white folks is helping, is orienting for, for instance, in New York City, it's finding the black and brown people who are already doing the work and helping them get resources. That's the quickest, easiest answer I can think of off the top of my head. So one way that looked this summer for me was saying to white organizations that wanted to do food pantry work and like wanted to do community gardening work in New York City for low income communities, which always normally translate to black and brown communities was how about you not come into this community and give and then leave because that's not helpful but why not find the leaders that are already doing this work and provide more to them so that they can continue to do it bigger so i think that co-opting part only comes in when one is not looking to see who's already doing it and inquiring what help they need because in just even in just giving money that might that's limiting their autonomy a little bit, they might need supplies, they might need other types of help, they might need admin work, they might need grant writing, et cetera. So I think figuring out who are the leaders on the grounds already that are doing that work and supplying for them. And I can speak from experience in doing that, I've been able to uplift my own community significantly and create jobs that I can now leave so that other black and brown people who don't know have an opportunity to increase their skill set. Any thoughts on that, Shamira? I agree with Amber. Um, work that I do in and around Athens, Georgia, that's been um, that's been like the key component. We have we have a lot of um, white allies and accomplices who are wanting to help. And I think struggle with struggle with how to just not being tapped in, like Amber said, to what's already being done in the communities. So yeah, I agree with everything she said, yeah. I think the main point is that often what happens with systemic racism is that the work that's already being done is overlooked. So people come into a community with solutions that aren't actually solutions because they don't come from community needs and communities culturally relevant experiences. And so part of the work, actually most of the work is finding where it's already being done and making sure that there's not this belief that there is nothing happening, there's no resistance, there's no community building, there's no movement building because it already is happening. So finding that is really important. Um, Can I just add one more thing? From a very agricultural perspective, what I really wanna pose to allies and non-Black people from cities is one reality that I've seen that a lot of people are not aware of when it comes to urban agriculture is the corruption of it through gentrification. Mm -hmm. And I really wanna put a big light on this because for myself, I was not able to get an urban agriculture job in New York City because you have a bunch of very white people coming from Ohio and Iowa and places where they can say, I grew up in a farming family, so I've been farming since I was 12. I deserve a position here which rightfully they do. But that's where you'll have organizations in cities who are not connected to their community because nobody from their community is farming for that organization. So I just wanna emphasize how maybe in saying to 
the local organizations that are doing something like agricultural work to encourage them to train people in that community so that your community partnerships are real and that that community can then welcome in the non-Blacks or the non-Brown people in a real way because you're having a different interface. So not hiring some, some other brown person that's not a part of the community, that's not the solution, but really going into the community, figuring out who needs an income and training them to do the job. And sure, on the side of the organization, that's a lot of work, but it's worth it in the end all be all. Absolutely, gentrification is an environmental issue and it does displace, further displace, displace again, Black people and Black people's ability to have connections to the places in which they live. And ownership is one of the main issues in which Black people get displaced. So if you're a farmer and you don't have land, you don't really have any sort of equity. You don't really have any sort of financial sustainability. Similarly, if you live in a city that has been disinvested from for years and years and years, and then bought up by real estate companies, which allow more people to come in, usually whiter people, usually middle class and upper class people, then you're further displaced again because you don't own the apartment that you rent or the house that you rent. And so again, there's this continual displacement of Black people from the spaces that they put energy and labor into. And so when you're trying to have connections to land in an urban environment, which was a question that someone asked, community gardens actually have to be started by and with the community land that is not being used for housing that's empty should be used for housing land that is used for parking lots should be used for growing food for the community because in some neighborhoods like in the bronx there's not actually grocery stores or fresh produce so these are ways that if you live in an urban environment you can be a part of this agricultural system non-urban places and urban places are deeply rooted and connected through agriculture but also now with climate change we know that we need to have more of this agricultural presence in cities we need to have more people knowing how to grow their food from seed to table really not just like knowing how to pick food but also knowing how to grow it um, because growing food sequesters carbon and uh, we see the effects of climate change in rural areas but also in cities um, another question uh, asks I think I'm just going to read it from Nick. I'm struck that the sustainability movement has been commodified and often fails to include and incorporate the expertise of Black people and other groups. To what extent is this also true of the regenerative, the regenerative movement, which in many ways grows from the sustainability movement? Can you read that the last part of that question one more time? To what extent is this all this sort of commodification also true of the regenerative movement? I, I'm thinking regenerative agriculture, permaculture, which in ways grows from the sustainability movement. So it's being commodified and also fails to include the expertise and histories of Black and Indigenous and other groups. Yeah, I think that that is beyond, beyond so crazy obvious not to people who are outside of agriculture but when you even get a quarter into agricultural knowledge or specifically permaculture it's very clear that permaculture is a big book of other people's indigenous practices um and for me who like went super hard to be like farmer certified through a training super hard to be permaculture certified only to find that the person that I'm learning from is telling me something that a white man has funneled to them, which was stolen from somebody else's land, was beyond exhausting, especially when the agricultural system itself is so broken because of slavery. So for me, it's felt pretty traumatic to enter agriculture because I wanted it to be a, a wholesome, warm place. But to to just get into like the land itself is stolen and was worked by stolen people. And that's the reason for like the, the climate change narrative, but then also now the knowledge that is good is also stolen knowledge has been exhausting. So it is a very real thing within regenerative, just that word in general, I don't even care what industry it applies to. I can for sure 100% assure you that it has everything to do with somebody's indigenous practice, but is not being told from their mouth. 
But I also think within the realm of regenerative, from a farmer's perspective, there is a lot of not farming people talking about regenerative agriculture based on their scientific studies. Um, and I think that is also problematic because we need more farmers talking about their actual lived experience with regenerative agriculture. So we can actually know like, word, it se sequesters carbon, which is helping, but like, is it helping their mental health? Is it helping them pay bills? So beyond like my thing with regenerative agriculture and agriculture in general is the cultural components are not touched upon enough. So we're thinking about best practices often, which is big in regenerative agriculture, but we're not thinking about how if we are good, if we are okay as farmers, we can then naturally have a regenerative farm. But for as long as the practices are, it's like versus people, that's, that's where I see regenerative ag right now. Shamira, any thoughts? I don't know enough about regenerative agriculture to comment. Okay, yeah, I mean, Amber said it all. I think most of the permaculture and other regenerative agricultural practices that we talk about are from indigenous people, if not all of them. And um, according to my knowledge about permaculture and the permaculture movement, which I believe started in the 70s, the two men who started that movement were from, I think, New Zealand, I believe, or Australia, and were basing a lot of their evidence on the indigenous Maori people's agricultural practices in uh, New Zealand, and a lot of the agricultural practices that were happening before European settlers went to Australia and New Zealand. So I know that that um, is a direct connection there, but what happens is things get institutionalized is rather than citing the indigenous people that were cited initially, what happens is you start citing the white, mostly male people who are talking about these practices and naming it something different. So we have all these names for, for things, permaculture, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, there's a lot of different names, but the practices themselves are about working with nature rather than against nature. And so in the case of African people planting seeds with their heel, that was about making sure to not disturb the soil, right? That's specifically about keeping the soil healthy uh, eco-cultural fire burning that lots of indigenous populations did, especially um, here in California, was about making sure that the forest could regenerate to grow new seeds and new trees, and also that when there were naturally occurring fires, that there wouldn't be more fuel. So all of these sort of indigenous practices um, that we are now returning to are seen as being somehow new, but they're actually a return to these things that people have done that have been overlooked for centuries. Um, I want to quickly answer a question from Whitney about the relationships between Black culture and quilting. How is this remarkable creative legacy of G's Ben carry, being carried forward by Black communities? Um, so G's Ben was a collective of women who were creating quilts to sell for money. Many of their families were affected by the civil rights movement, meaning they were working in the civil rights movement and as a result, uh, did not have a lot of income. Additionally, some of their families had been sharecroppers or farmers and that was no longer economically viable for them or they had been pushed off their land. So they used this black crafting tradition of making quilts, something they had done for their families for generations. And they said, this is actually textile art what if we sold these quilts to make money? And so there were several uh, Black women quilting collectives. G's Ben is one of them. Um, and now lots of artists have been using textile arts um, and, and quilting specifically as a way to carry on this legacy of um, sort of textiles and, and Black women's cultural relationship to textiles and fiber art. Um, Zenobia Bailey is a like urban crochet music art visual artist where she creates these like amazing crocheted uh, murals that are based on like black funk music and black cultural traditions. Um, Sonia Gomez is a Brazilian artist. She was born in what used to be a textile manufacturing community in Brazil, but because of 
globalized capitalism was moved to Asia. And so she started collecting pieces from this fiber factory, just things that had um, been left there to make art using like found pieces of cloth um, and fiber. And uh, Faith Ringgold, who's a Black American artist, is most notably known for making these quilts that depict uh, Black American life in Harlem. So there's a lot of uh, ways that the, the Black textile traditions have continued via art. Um, and I know there has been some um, resurgence of this thought during the uprisings that were happening this past summer. There was Black knitters knitting Black Lives Matter and putting them in parts of cities or knitting it around a tree, for example. And so there are these subcultures of Black people who are very um, specifically doing work, both work towards activism and work towards art. Sometimes it's both with fibers, with knitting, with quilting, um, with textiles. So I think that's, that's a history that is continued on in modern practices for sure. Um, okay, let's go through a few more of these questions. Um, I saw one about land acquisition that I want to try to find. Um, okay. As a as a young person interested in land acquisition with no prospects, as you described, what kind of collective ownership models have you heard of? I believe this is directed at you, Amber. Um, the collective model that I am currently about to discuss is with Chris Newman from Silvanaqua Farms. Um, somebody in the comments had just men mentioned Polyface Farms and Chris Newman and his whole crew are responsible for, you know, really exposing polyface farms and showing how they are racist and how they are invasive and how they have stolen knowledge, et cetera. Um, but Chris Newman is somebody I deem a mentor who is really the first black farmer that I've seen ever put out, like what does it look like for he himself and his family are black and indigenous. So he is calling it a black and indigenous land collective. Um, and what that looks like is everybody has a stake in the business itself. Uh, nobody is an employee of anybody else. And that is something that is existing with Chris Newman and his crew already. If it's not existing in fullness, they are for sure on their way of doing that between themselves. I'm walking in to explore what it looks like as Chris Newman does livestock farming only, him and his crew do that. I'm walking in wondering what it would look like to add veg to that. So I think that is one way that um, collective land ownership can happen is there are some people who only want to work with animals. Um, and that may not be butchering them, that may be selling manure from them, et cetera. And then there will be people who only wanna do veg. And then there may be people who only wanna build beautiful housing. So I think it's about figuring out who wants to do what, because I for sure can say I'm not interested in doing livestock. I am not interested in doing any type of carpentry, but I am interested in doing veg. But I'm aware that these other realms are needed for our collective success. Um, even by way of like, there are people who have millions of acres doing grain and they might have a realization that grain, the grain that they've been growing is evil and they need to revitalize their grounds. What does it look like for a veg farmer to walk in and say, well, give me a quarter of your land. Let me revitalize that via, I have some cows that I can let graze the land and refertilize the ground and then butcher them for processing or I'm down to grow veg there. So I think for a long time, agriculture has been sectioned to be by your expertise, your preferred skill set. And so in bringing people together, it's about having all of those skill sets on one piece of land. 
I would also add that community land trusts is another model that a lot of Black people are using, not just for growing food and agricultural land, but also for housing. And essentially, a community land trust is a nonprofit organization that's formed to hold land in a trust, specifically so that it can't be bought when uh, instances of gentrification are happening. And the community is able to use that land for whatever makes most sense for their necessities. Usually, that includes housing, that includes gardening for food, that includes creating opportunities for multi-purpose space and cultural gatherings. So I would say um, community land trusts are another model. One of the most effective and well-known community land trusts is Cooperative Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, so if you want to look into that, that is a resource um, for community land trusts. Just one more thing that I want to throw out there is I am deeply interested in what it looks like for Black urban communities to collab with indigenous reservations in North America. Mm -hmm. Like that is my for sure big dream because black people need to get out of the projects and indigenous people are in deep poverty on their reservations. So I, my vision and I'm sure our collective vision, I'm sure everybody is holding this, but what does it look like? And so when that land was returned to the indigenous people of Oklahoma and they got Tulsa, I'm so interested in what it looks like for that indigenous community when they are ready to open their doors to black people and talk about what it looks like for both of those bodies of people to exist in that town, which is originally indigenous, but became a black Wall Street. And, and so destroyed I, as a result. Amen. So, so I, indigenous people were displaced, the black Wall Street was destroyed, and now it's been returned back to indigenous people. So. To me, that looks like healing. So what does that mean when we include all the peoples who were displaced in that project? Um, Amen. Thank you for bringing that up. I also want to mention the Shumi Land Trust for people who are in the Bay Area in California. Uh, the Shumi Land Tax is a tax you can pay, um, which goes to a land trust held by women, mostly Ohlone women, to be able to buy back their land here in the Bay Area. So it's a land tax that I pay, um, and you could pay as much or as little as you want, and eventually they'll be able to buy back this land, which is the indigenous land of the Ohlone Chichenyo people on the land that they currently have. They do a lot of regenerative agriculture and permaculture. Um, so I would say that's, if you, if you can look in your area, there might be other forms of land trust held by indigenous people who are trying to access their land again. Which brings me to a another question by A. Marks. What connections are known between North American indigenous land stewardship and pre-colonial African land stewardship? Uh, I wanna um, mention some points about that, but then I wanna pass it to Shamir to see if you have any feelings about the relationships between black communities and indigenous communities um, and sustainability. So one of the things that was brought up while um, looking into plantation slavery was this uh, issue of clearing land to create plantations. Now indigenous communities and pre-colonial tropical African communities did clear land, but it wasn't in totality to, to plant monoculturally. So there are clearing land practices, which is necessary to grow food in some cases that both Africans in West and Central Africa were doing and that indigenous people were doing in the Americas before white European settlers came. But one of the reasons why white European settlers needed African enslaved Africans to be enslaved was because indigenous people in the Americas in most cases refused to work with them because of the ways that they were violently clearing the land and getting rid of diversity and getting rid of habitat for some of the deer and other species that indigenous people um, relied on. And so knowing that uh, West Africans and tropical Africans had extensive knowledge of agricultural practices, including clearing, was one of the reasons why they were brought to the Americas and including um, planting in variegated land and land that could be a little bit temperamental. So I know um, for a fact certain practices like land clearing and um, also uh, developing seeds that can be grown perennially was something that indigenous people in the Americas and tropical Africans developed. So as I mentioned before, the cotton seed was grown by family units perennially, um, not for mass 
trade, but just for themselves. And uh, as we know, with all the corn here, maize was another seed that the indigenous communities um, developed that could be developed perennially in small batches as well as in larger batches. Um, and so I, I'll pass it to Shamira to just add to some of your research about relationships between indigenous communities and black communities. Sure. Um, so there's always been a relationship between indigenous communities and black communities, specifically in the US. And my relationship, my, my research um, looks specifically at uh, Afro and in, in indigenous uh, peoples and um, the, the work around sustainability, um, not just in the fashion industry, but largely. Um, I am a part of um, an organization called the Red House Project, which uh, looks at both Black and Indigenous peoples and the solidarities around um, land back, Black Lives Matter, um, sustainability issues, environmentalism. So there's always been this relationship um, between those two communities and Amber, when you said you're interested in seeing how that, how that would operationalize um, like on a land basis that is very exciting. I would love to, to see that too, um, sharing knowledge and all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, there's always been this relationship and there are organizations all over North America that are devoted um, to indigenous and black solidarities around um, justice issues. And depending on the tribe or the area, um, those are all be different. So whatever um, state you're in or whatever locale you're in, you'll probably just have to um, look up those specific organizations, but they do exist. Thank you, Shamir. Um, we're gonna do two more questions and then we're gonna end a question from Scott. Is there integration with family preservation lands to convert their land to regenerative and even divest from their land? Um, a combination of government subsidies or tax credits, funding from foundations, Basically, the question is about buying out white settlers uh, from their land or tra land transition. Um, I will mention a group uh, organization called Resource Generation, which is for people who are white and also non-white who have a lot of wealth, who would like to give that away in some way. I think that includes when you have land uh, intergenerationally, what does it look like to turn that land into a collective ownership model or to give it to a community land trust. Um, and also uh, there are ways that you can give your land to an organization also. Um, I'm not sure on the, the technicalities of that, but what I do know is that there's not actually government subsidies to transition family land into collective ownership of land. That would be something that requires policy and advocacy, and I think there should be ways and there should be routes to um, allow people who are getting land intergenerationally to give it away, because what's happening with gentrification is people whose family own land in the Midwest or in the Northwest are not wanting to work on that land. They're not wanting to be farmers. The land is usually at this point mostly worked by Mexican people and either like rented out for people to work. So since people are moving into cities and not wanting to be on the land, why not give it to people who can collectively run it and manage it? Um, so those are just some points for me, but Amber, maybe you have more feelings about that. I think the only thing I would add is pertaining to cultural components, which is a lot of white people will say to younger farmers that want to run farms they'll say the land is there and like you can come and do whatever you want but as somebody who is from a city that culturally is very black when you are going into the middle of nowhere the most important question you can ask to a landowner is what is the culture of people how many trump signs did you see during the election is there any artists that live next door these are all very very important comments because right now they will throw a bunch of land at you and it will look super beautiful. But as a brown person, your life still might be endangered. You still might experience discrimination based off of trying to sell your market produce at the market and not getting in for some strange reason. So I think as beautiful as it is to see that land be wanting to be passed over, it's important for those land owners to understand how white supremacy can exist outside of that land mass and like what what is the protective measure for brown people who you are calling in to very fiercely rural agricultural white spaces? 
Thank you. And the last question that we're going to end on, which is directed to all of us, and maybe Shamira, you could start it, start us off. Ella wants to know what has healing looked like for all of us over the years through land, textiles, and art. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> but um, for me, I've been uh, very connected to my ancestors just from clothing and textiles. Cloth um, has made me very connected. My grandmother was a seamstress, so I was always around clothing and in yarns, and it was just a part of um, me growing up. So um, the healing the healing process has been, I'll say, very difficult and arduous around that because of things like we talked about the commodification of it, the, the uh, I'll say appropriation of it, the, all of the things that white supremacy brings to our, our lives, our embodied experiences um, has made the healing process really hard, but I mean, no healing process is easy. So for me, just being a truth seeker in the ways in which textiles and clothing are not, just like whimsical and frivolous things that it's like a deeply ingrained part of who I am and a part of who black people are and a lot of a part of how a lot of cultures um, are how they operate it's a part of our spiritual practice it's like it's just I've noticed for me that it's become much more of a spiritual process to relate to clothing and cloth and land in the environment and all of the things. Um, and so again, the process has been hard, but very fulfilling and encouraging and motivating. So, yeah. Thank you, Shamira. Amber, I know so much of your story is about healing, but do you wanna add anything to, to this continued process of healing for you? I think overall, and I can only speak from a black perspective, but I think and for indigenous people, I, I think I can allude to that narrative as well. I, I think the healing, to be at this point, we are a very special group of people to be on the earth at this time. I know that sounds wicked, but in terms of understanding where we were as a, a people, where our ancestors were in terms of growing food, and then understanding how for specifically for black people, how colonization came in and our disconnect with land came from cotton, which then embedded deeper to then disconnect from food, right? Like for me, that that was such an eye-opening moment to be a part of this, to really realize like, oh, our disconnect from food comes from cotton. And so for us to be returning to like food justice components absolutely interlinks to what is like fiber justice, what is justice for the fashion industry and so just to, I, I just want to present how that is super interlinked as far as people think it's apart those two things are super interlinked and in my head throughout this whole conversation I've just been seeing images of cotton next to squash and like wanting to have more conversation about the inner connection between food and fashion and how those go hand in hand and need each other but I want to emphasize the Black people's disconnection with food came from cotton first, which for me feels like a huge revelation. Thank you, Amber. And I relate to everything both of you are saying. I often wear my grandmother's clothes. She had a lot of clothes that she made and that were made for her that just happened to fit me. I'm actually wearing her earrings today. And so I sort of make my body an altar to her life by wearing her clothes and by not buying new clothes for the most part, if I, if I can. Um, and so part of my relationship to healing, to healing to the environment is by thinking about the ways that I consume or choose not to consume. And so along with wearing my grandmother's clothes and continuing to wear hand-me-downs, which when I was younger felt not good, but now I realize is a form of resistance to the fashion capitalist system is also growing food. 
Um, this is the first year where I have started to grow food and to eat from my garden. And every night I can eat something that has been grown in the place that I live. And that is hugely, hugely fulfilling for my spiritual being. Um, also just being out in nature. Last year was the first time I went to a national park and I was like, oh my God, Moab, Utah is so beautiful. And I called my parents. I was like, why did we go to national parks growing up? And they were like, because it was dangerous for a black family. They're like, you saw all those guns in Utah and that pretty nature. I was like, yes. And I was with a group of people, so I felt safe, but I was like, oh, wow. Even the places that I can go to be in nature when I was growing up were not safe because we were black. And so part of my healing is going on hikes by myself, is going to national parks, sometimes with people, sometimes with myself, is exploring these parts of the country that I previously was not able to explore because of fear of safety, I still sometimes feel unsafe, but at least I know that this land belongs to indigenous people so they can't displace me from it, right? This land is not even your land, so you can't tell me where I belong. And so that connection to belonging has increased for me um, immensely over the past few years. So I wanna just give the greatest and deepest gratitude to Shamir and Amber. I am so pleased with you all joining me. I'm so pleased with the conversations we've been able to have, the stories that have been shared. Um, on the Fibershed website for the symposium, I think our contact information is there and they might send around the slides afterwards. Please connect with us on LinkedIn, Instagram, we all have websites. Thank you all for joining us and being part of this conversation. And I will turn it over back to Rebecca. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Amber and Shamara.